Hey everyone, welcome back to Secret Plus. I am Trace. This is episode three of three in our series all about meat. Meat, in case you didn't understand the weirdness. If you haven't watched Secret Plus before, it's a show where we take a big topic, we break it into chunks. If you haven't seen the first two episodes of this series, go back and watch those. They were last week when we had an interview and the week before when I talked just like I'm gonna do today. Now, today we're gonna talk about why we started eating meat in the first place and how it got us where we are today. Without it, we would not be the majestic and gangly humans that we currently are. However, in the future, do we still need meat? At some point, it's like the Industrial Revolution, right? It's a bubble where we wanna have all of this stuff and then uh, can't we, you know, pare down and go back to just kind of casual meat relationship? Instead of having like this meat obsession that we're currently in right now? Let's kick into it and find out. For some people, meat is murder. For some people, bacon is literally the best thing in the world. Uh, steak and potatoes might be the only thing that a 1950s man ate on TV, uh, but meat is not the only thing out there. Meat is a very important part of a diet, especially a diet high in calories and proteins. However, it's not always been that way, okay? Just come with me on this. Also, I'm sort of over bacon, but that's a sidebar. You can comment all you want about that. At some point, we did not eat meat. We just didn't do it. Not just modern humans, we've always pretty much eaten meat, at least in some part, but I'm talking throughout history, there were points where we just didn't eat meat, ancient humans and so on. We're gonna talk all about it. It's not entirely known when we started meat eating, uh, but if you study our evolutionary cousins, chimps and gorillas, you start to see that we had some common ancestor where we must have split from them. Because chimps, they eat meat. Gorillas, they are completely vegetarian. So at some point, a shared ancestor with all of us, the chimps and us decided meat, the gorillas and a number of other primates and apes decided vegetarian. Why did our common ancestor choose potatoes over steak is a pretty important question. So most of our human ancestors, if you look back like, I mean ancient, ancient, millions of years ago, most of our cousins and our ancestors are vegetarian. And it has a lot to do with niches and with competition in the wild. There are lots of predators, there's lots of prey, and you have to go out and compete. And not eating meat opens up a lot more options for where to get your nutritious intake. More than 15 million years ago, came about the first primate ever, at least that we know of, and it was called Purgatorius. The Atlantic has a great piece all about the history of meat eating through our lineage. Uh, you should definitely check it out. There's a link in the description. Purgatorius was a vegan. It was actually a set of different animals. So we've got small monkeys, larger apes, more gorilla-sized. Uh, and then six million years ago, that group evolved into a new group, Salanthropus tachdensis. I'm not very good at these Latin names. And that's the first hominin ever. That's what humans are, hominins. And Salanthropus walked upright. It ate plants and seeds and nuts. Then three to four million years ago, Australopithecus came on the scene, still didn't eat a lot of meat, mostly vegetarian, some meat, some fruit, some leaves. And we know all this by the size and shape of the guts that we find, not the soft tissues, but just the shapes of the abdominal cavities and the way that the bones all fit together, we can determine what the guts of these animals looked like. Somewhere around two and a half million years ago though, was a shift. All these nuts and seeds that we'd been eating since Salanthropus, they're high in fat and they're low in fiber. As we eat more nuts and more seeds, we need to be able to break down these high fat, low fiber foods. There's a lot of calories in seeds and nuts. And that means we need a longer small intestine to do that. A longer small intestine is also good for another type of dietary function, eating meat. So over time, and we're talking tens of thousands of years, generations and generations, thousands of generations, over this incremental slow evolutionary process, our intestine gets longer, we're eating more of these varied diets from leaves to nuts and meats and all sorts of different things. And eventually we get 
to meat eating. When we get to the early homo groups, you know, we're homo sapien, for example, we started to go all in on the omnivorous diet and get more meat. We started grabbing meat when it was possible. And eventually we evolved to be more meat eating. The reason we did that is because meat is a very calorie dense, very protein dense type of food. Some other animal has taken all the effort of eating all these plants and nuts and seeds and fruits and kind of combined them together into this little protein bar, <laughs> which we call a steak, right? <laughs> but the thing is, that doesn't necessarily make it the best type of food all the time. Without meat, we would have never evolved to be these amazing world conquering species that we have become to be. And you can see where this comes about in our history in a study in Nature from 2016 titled The Impact of Meat and Lower Paleolithic Food Processing Techniques on Chewing in Humans. They looked at chewing because that's a good indication of what a species eats. And it turns out Paleolithic humans ate meat and that's why we don't have a strong bite force. Our gut is a little smaller. We have a longer small intestinal space. Our facial muscles are not as pronounced because we're not grinding lots of different plant matter down and, and our brain can get bigger because we have that calorie dense steak bar that we can eat. Not really a steak, we're eating all sorts of stuff, but you get the point. Meat has all of these calories in one place, and if you can harvest them, they found if you could replace one third of the diet of ancient humans, they would chew less and they get more energy. And this has nothing to do with cooking, which is a whole separate thing. This is just the meat eating itself. 2.6 million years ago until about 10,000 years ago, that's considered the Paleolithic era, and this is when they're studying. And it turns out during that time, our jaws got smaller, our brains got bigger, our guts got smaller, and we were able to take in more and more of this meat product. Once you can eat more calorically dense foods, you can eat fewer times during the day. It actually frees up time in your schedule to do other things. Think about pandas, think about uh, cows, think about other obligate vegetarian animals, they're eating a lot. They're eating most of their day. They're chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing because they have to grind all that plant matter down. They have to have a long gut so they can digest all of that plant matter. With us, our gut got smaller so we could eat this meat product and it's great. And because it's so calorically dense, it lets us eat fewer times during the day. We can build things, we can think about things, we can explore the world around us. We don't have this tie to a tree or to a specific plane where we have to stay. And on top of that, it got incrementally better over the generations. As we got better at eating meat, we got better at doing other things other than just sitting around and eating all the time. And now we've sort of come full circle because I think last vacation I literally just ate all the time and it was amazing but I also wasn't running from predators most, most of the time. The funny thing is all of this eating kind of evolved so quickly in our gut that we didn't really catch up in our face. Peter Lucas, the author of Dental Functional Morphology, I found while I was looking through all this meat research, that mammal jaws, like if you think of a mammal out in the world, they look like a classic comic book, right? Uh, think of a gorilla, uh, they're square. It looks like a comic book hero, but the human jaw is more rounded. It's actually really bad for what we use it for. And he said, quote, it's really the only body part that regularly needs attention and surgery, which I found really interesting. And part of that is because of what we eat and how we eat it. Thanks, evolution. Ugh. That said though, we shouldn't stop eating meat altogether. We do need to eat meat. Even vegans need something from meat called vitamin B12. It only comes from meat, eggs, and dairy. It's a meat product or a animal byproduct, no matter what. Vegans who don't want to damage an animal or have moral quandaries about it, they still need B12 and they get it through a bacterial byproduct that is then put into a supplement or fortified into vegan foods. But it still comes from bacteria or from meats, the only place where B12 can come from. A very low B12 intake can cause anemia and nervous system damage. That's how much our bodies rely on meat product or animal product, that if we don't eat it, our nervous system doesn't function particularly well and we get anemia. That's how much we've evolved to eat this product. Today, we do have some problems with meat eating. I'm not here to say meat is the best, everyone should eat meat. I don't think that that is true. I think vegetarianism and veganism has just as much of a place in society as omnivores, as meat eaters, as you know, carnivorous people who believe that that's all that they need to sustain themselves. 
I'm not here to judge. That's not my job. Culturally, vegetarianism and veganism is very important for a lot of cultures throughout the world, and you might not know a lot about some of the arguments for and against that. I'm not going to get into a lot of them here, but I do think one that gets a little bit less play is the resources and economics argument to be more vegetarian. Not 100% necessarily, but more. Think about it this way. How many burgers do you get from one cow? Just one. There's not an exact answer to this, but there are a number of different studies that I could put together based on uh, the research that I'd done. According to Oklahoma State and San Diego State Universities, breaking down a cow into those terms by pound means you get about 40% of a cow's weight to go into meat. And that's meat that we eat, including every kind of the meat, the ribs, T-bone steaks, all the fancy cuts, all of that stuff. So you might get 185 pounds, or about 84 kilograms, of lean trim from one 1,200 or 1,000 pound cow. That's not a lot. That's what becomes then ground beef. That's 740 quarter pounders con queso or royales with cheese, if you will, from a single cow. 740, which also sounds like a lot of quarter pounders, but that's about 10 seconds of McDonald's burger sales. 10 seconds for a cow. Every 10 seconds, McDonald's is churning through one cow. And that's just McDonald's. That's not your local restaurant. That's not the beef that you buy at the store. According to numbers from Business Insider, by the way, but still, and sidebar, each of those burgers requires about 460 gallons of water to produce, or about 1,750 liters, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, and that is a lot of water. Eventually, producing animals at this rate is going to be unsustainable. How much meat is there in the world? There's a lot. There's basically more than we would ever need. It's so cheap that you can get it for less than a dollar, right? However, that doesn't necessarily mean it's sustainable forever. There won't be enough land or water in the world to feed everyone who wants a hamburger eventually. I didn't do the math, and even though many people have talked about it, the numbers vary. But let's just say eventually, maybe not in my lifetime, but in potentially some of our collective lifetimes, we will run out of this resource. And there are other places we could get meat, just to take that branch for a minute. Horses, it's found in Mongolia, Bulgaria, Switzerland, Belgium, and France. You can eat horse meat. The American butcher shops actually sold horse meat until World War II. Today, that doesn't really happen that much. We also eat things like kangaroo and goat and pigeon and camel, uh, all sorts of other types of meat. We're not even going to get into fish and in the ocean and the overfishing of that's a whole separate conversation. And also, if you remember from episode one, fish ain't meat. There are other things that we don't eat, mostly for cultural reasons, like dogs and cats. Dog meat was actually legal in 44 states, even until several years ago. The current numbers I don't have, but 44 states is a lot of states. And generally, you could, if you wanted, kill and eat a dog as long as you're not doing it cruelly, because animal cruelty laws do apply, even though if you do it quickly and cleanly in a slaughterhouse situation, you potentially could do that. But there are a few states with laws against eating something like dogs and cats. Um, and most you just can't trade in animal carcasses and animals that we seem to care about. But it's mainly cultural, and a lot of the laws aren't written to be like, specifically, these animals you cannot eat. It's more, you can't trade in animal carcasses of these types, or you can't kill animals cruelly in these ways. It's fascinating, um, but it is another source of meat. And even though culturally we don't like eating dog, that doesn't mean the dog meat is bad. It just means we don't like it, right? Oh, by the way, on the show, our theory sort of is that we don't seem to eat things that enrich our life or make our life better or animals that seem to work for us, which is why pigs, even though they're very intelligent, we do eat. And dogs, which are also very intelligent, we don't because they enrich our lives, whereas pigs may or may not, even though some people do keep them as pets. It gets very confusing. In the end, there are also other sources of proteins to take another track from uh, meat and the future of it, and that is insects. We could eat insects just as easily. You can mix insect proteins into flowers and make protein-rich cookies and muffins and all sorts of other carbs that we really love. Crickets are twice as efficient for the amount of protein to produce, and they actually taste okay. I've eaten them many times. They sort of taste nutty. I've eaten ants and all sorts of other insects, and they're very good for you. And again, most of our hang-ups come from the cultural experience, not the actual meat or its viability as a product, which I find fascinating. In the future, we're going to run out of space. We're going to run out of a place to grow meat. And our alternative might be what we were talking about in the last episode of Seeker Plus, and that is lab-grown meat, right? 
I'd love to try lab-grown meat. I read a statistic that lab-grown meat used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now it's down into the tens of dollars per pound, which is very affordable. Still not beef affordable, but very. And we really just have to decide that that meat is viable. Right now, we're putting a lot of effort into growing cows and growing pigs for consumption. But what if we could just take their cells and cultivate them into all the beef we ever needed in the most efficient way possible? Wouldn't that be better? You might be skeeved out. Why? Tell us in the comments, please. Remember that nature study I'm talking about chewing? When they replaced one third of our diet, we completely changed our face. We changed a whole bunch of our characteristics. I think what you could think of it as is that we didn't start eating all the meat. We started eating some meat. And this is the path to being more vegetarian if you're worried about the economy of the world and the resource use to grow meat. Sausage for breakfast, meatball subs for lunch, and steaks for dinner, that's not some meat. Of the three meals, you ate meat in three of them, right? Thinking about how you consume your food could change the whole world. The whole planet could be better, not just you. And that's okay. It's a whole other topic, though. If you haven't watched all the episodes in this series, go back and watch those. Make sure you watch this series as well about personality. We did that one a couple of months ago. And please subscribe so you get the next series of Seeker Plus. We're going to do this every month with more episodes and more chunks of knowledge. If you have suggestions, go to the community tab. I'm Trace. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.